Welcome to another expert podcast in UNESCO's Inclusive Policy Lab. This is part of our expert series focusing on a post-COVID reset. And of course, from our perspective, which is a normative one, we're talking about a reset along a more equitable and smart path. As always in this podcast series, the conversation will revolve around first concrete policy measures that our experts see as being conducive to such a recovery. And secondly, the data and the knowledge that we have or that we would need in order to inform these policy shifts. In today's podcast, our expert guest is Holly Krambeck. Holly works with the World Bank's Development Economics Data Group. She founded the Development Data Partnership a coalition between international organizations and the private sector to further responsible use of third party data in international development. And this role and the expertise coming from it will be key to our conversation today. Holly, welcome. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Oh, John, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my name is John Crowley. I'm UNESCO's Chief of Research Policy and Foresight, and I'll be hosting this podcast. Um, and I'm co-hosting it with my colleague, Yulia Shevchuk, UNESCO's lead on inclusive policies and data use in policy and the general editor of this podcast series. Uh, this particular podcast falls under a stream on data for good. Um, we've been discussing it over previous weeks already with some very interesting angles coming up from the various conversations. And today we'd like to be talking about new data and in particular, if, why, and how the private and the public sectors should be working together to advance the use of new data for the public good. So let me first um, push the conversation in the direction of issues, loopholes, barriers. Um, it's hard to overstate the intricacy of the current data landscape with issues around access, ownership, stewardship, and capacity to use new data uh, being on the list. So the first question I'd like to ask you, Holly, is could you give your diagnosis of the key issues and barriers in this area and explain why, in terms of your criteria for, for the assessment, these are really the critical things that people should be thinking about? Got it. Well, uh, assuming uh, that you think public-private data sharing is a good idea, uh, there are quite a few barriers presenting these collaborations from happening more often. I would start with the notion of a market failure where uh, the companies represent the data supply, uh, where they may be perfectly willing to share data for a public good use case, uh, but they need to protect the privacy of their customers and their business interests, and they need to manage their costs. Uh, the act of providing data is, is not free. And on the demand side, uh, oh, we're kind of a mess. Uh, we have many players, international organizations, academic institutions, NGOs, and governments, all requesting data from the same handful of global companies, uh, not always certain the data will meet their needs. So without any internationally accepted norms for data licenses, data privacy and security, alignment of incentives, it's really difficult for this market to take shape. Thank you. Going a bit deeper into these questions of access, there are two different ways of thinking about this issue. And in our previous conversations in this podcast series, we've had somewhat different perspectives from different people coming from different angles. On the one hand, um, some of our guests have been saying, listen, there's enough data. Um, that isn't the problem. Uh, the problem is capacities to use data, which uh, particularly in the public sector are not at the level they should be. Um, whereas others have perhaps emphasized more that some of the key data that the public sector needs is actually not in practice available because of access barriers of various kinds. And therefore, um, the public sector needs to have better access. Now, of course, both things can be true. Um, not enough access, not enough capacity to use what the public sector has. Um, so they're not a dichotomy. What, what, what's your view on this, uh, particularly in the context of the COVID pandemic and what it implies for, for, for data issues? What do you see as the most important of these two challenges? Oh, those are very interesting because um, there is, oh, you can make an argument for both or neither. Um, but I would say uh, there 
There may have been a time when the public sector knew more about our people and economies than companies, uh, but that time is certainly passing. Uh, and unless our governments can keep up with new methods to monitor and measure the direction of our countries, it's going to become increasingly difficult for them to make meaningful policy. On our side at the World Bank, the pandemic has done a pretty good job of revealing some of the cracks in traditional government data collection. Statistics we look at today could easily reflect the state of a community some years ago. During the pandemic, governments, particularly those in emerging economies, they need more frequent, more granular information to understand how their policies are affecting and will affect people. And generally, that more frequent and granular information are the purview of the private sector. But linking private sector data to public need isn't easy, as we mentioned, with the accessibility issues. And I think the issue you raised is correct. Uh, it's not just access. That's just one piece. Even if we can make these data available for governments to use in decision making, it's not easy because of other issues related to IT requirements and technical capacity and challenges related to responsible data use. Holly, you mentioned over demand. You mentioned that there are many um, agencies, many countries, many actors demanding data, yet a handful of companies um, supplying it. Uh, my inclination is to think that if there is such high demand and low supply, uh, someone is winning and someone is losing. So uh, who is uh, uh, winning? international organizations uh, to the detriment of national governments or governments in the north uh, to the detriment of the country, governments in the global south, or maybe it's not the case. What's your take on that? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I guess if I think about it, I wouldn't define the playing field in terms of winners and losers uh, because what we're talking about is helping governments make better decisions for public service and infrastructure design and provision. So we're not taking away, nobody loses, but if we can improve these collaborations and more effectively leverage these data, everybody wins, mainly people in countries who are the beneficiaries of better government decisions. But it's true, in the current state, if you have uh, a global company like a Twitter or a LinkedIn or Google, Facebook, there are, there are only so many of these uh, and you have many entities seeking their data and they only have so much bandwidth to sign all of those legal agreements, to format the data, answer technical questions, transmit the data. So it's true, it's not practical to send the data to every entity that needs them. And the question, are international organizations crowding out governments? Are governments crowding out academic institutions? I think the way we need to think about it is, uh, can we set up intermediaries so that access can be facilitated for many parties, but we're not putting the burden of that access on the companies themselves for whom this may not be their business model? On the question of uh, intermediaries, um, who would those be? We, we are one <laughs> uh, in the international development sphere, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about how we've set up the partnership. But uh, I don't believe there should be only one. I think there's scope to have many intermediaries acting as go-betweens, relieving companies of the burdens associated with data access, management, security, privacy, ensuring responsible data use. Companies should just be responsible for providing data and then seeing all of the wonderful public good benefits that can come from that. And then the intermediary would then be incentivized to ensure as many other entities as possible can use these data where the challenges warrant. Thank you. The the um, follow-up I want to I wanted to make is a bit, I suppose, symmetrical with what you've just said about the, the the private sector and its responsibilities. The public sector actually has a wealth of information from its operations 
I'm thinking of social services in particular, uh, which is often uh, not just quantitative, but qualitative as well, very uh, narrative, uh, very personalized, and often unused uh, in policy design. Uh, this is well known to just to take one example in, in the area of mental health, for instance, the gap between what health institutions know about people and about patterns of mental health and what is actually built into policy frameworks is uh, remarkable. And there are some very good reasons for that in terms of protection of confidentiality and privacy and so on. But at the same time, the loss of knowledge is astonishing um, between what is collected and what's actually used. Um, historians, of course, many years later get the opportunity to make the connections and uh, have uh, a great time piecing together the various parts of the archives once uh, data protection rules have expired. But that's not useful for the design and implementation of policies. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is, um, is there a way of finding a better compromise between the undoubted need to ensure confidentiality, privacy, and uh, even secrecy in certain cases, and the desire for a more richer, for a richer, more informed approach to uh, policy thinking? Oh, interesting. So, um, do you mean particularly just focused on public sector data and how public sector uses its own data for yeah. getting private sector piece? For, mm. for the purpose of this question, yes. I know that's that's a rather artificial sure. distinction, but just to keep it simple. Yes, I, I do have some experience working with uh, U.S. benefits data for our um, food stamps program, SNAP, um, prison records uh, and um, tax records, which are all generated by different systems. And uh, the, the exercise I was involved in was merging these data sets so that we could trace individuals through the benefits programs, through prison and through employment. And what was interesting about this exercise was how uh, unachievable it was, given <laughs> how the records are, are not um, mergeable, given um, you know, the U.S. doesn't have a, a national ID system, given errors in the data, formatting, there, there is so much cleaning involved, you can never be certain about the results. And I remember through that exercise, I appreciated how difficult it was. I didn't really like the analysis we were doing. I didn't feel comfortable tracing individuals <laughs> through these systems, because what, what are the conclusions that we are to draw, like, um, it, it didn't. It didn't feel right, and I and I appreciated that the U.S. made it so difficult <laughs> to make it possible to trace individuals. And we think about this quite a bit, actually, uh, when we're doing our data work with governments in emerging economies. Um, where do we want to support our governments in making decisions that target individuals? or uh, decisions that target something broader across a sector, like improving the movement of goods or what have you. Um, and we definitely fall on the latter. <laughs> we don't feel we have a place to advise governments on policies that target individuals. I guess to say there's a, there's a spectrum of countries as well, where you have countries that have paper records and haven't digitized all of their systems yet, and don't have formal national ID systems. Most of their citizens aren't even registered, not most, but may, they may have a portion of citizens who are not registered. So they would be some, some distance away from achieving that kind of picture on, on their citizens. Whereas you have other countries like in Estonia uh, that seem to have figured all of this out <laughs> and, and are quite organized and it seems to work pretty well for them. It's a big issue about how much you trust your government um, to make the right decisions if they had all the information about their people in one place. Thank you very much, Holly, for the um, uh, discussion about uh, issues. We already started um, talking about certain solutions or at least solution spaces. Um, and indeed, one issue that arose from your earlier comments uh, is the question, for instance, how individualized data 
can be used to identify not individualization of policy, but patterns that can inform policy, uh, even once the data has been both anonymized and collectivized. And of course, there's a very interesting space there of uh, understanding how individual data can be used without being attached uh, to the uh, individual, which is perhaps one of the ways round uh, the, the difficulties of uh, trust in government systems that uh, you mentioned. Um, but uh, le let's try to go a bit further. Um, thinking in, in big picture terms about possible solutions to the kinds of issues we identified uh, earlier, um, what would you regard as the key things that need to change in terms of regulations and established practices so as to allow for more effective and responsible use of data in collective policy and decision making. And of course, thinking here in terms of an action agenda for institutions like uh, the World Bank, like UNESCO, um, we can't do everything. So what should we really focus on? What are the key priorities? I'd say there's two parts to that. Uh, one, there's making the data available, making it possible to receive the data at all. And then the second is uh, what we put in place to ensure the data are responsibly used. Um, on the former, um, it would be, oh, if I could think really big <laughs> on, and wave this a magic wand, we would, <laughs> we would need a, a formal global market that links the supply of data sets and their potential use cases and built into that market would be an incentive structure for companies to provide good data and, and also a means for them to monetize the effort and recoup their costs. We would need norms around data license agreements. I think most entities who have tried to receive data from a company have discovered their legal counsel <laughs> and attorneys uh, and realize how uh, non-standard this process is. Um, but if there were agreed upon norms and arbitration options, I think we could streamline this. But the licenses are key to ensure we protect companies' IP and property rights. And so they're, they're important to get right. And we understand why they take a while, but they're definitely a sticking point. Third, uh, if there were some globally accepted standards for data security accreditation, uh, where an entity seeking to receive potentially sensitive data can show that they have the systems, procedures, and enforceable policies in place to ensure that data are managed sufficiently to prevent leakage, I think that would uh, do a lot to smooth things over and to facilitate the flows of data. And then once, once that access is facilitated, it goes to your question about responsible data use. This is something my team and I talk about quite a bit because it's, it's loaded. There are a lot of principles out there on responsible data use, and we haven't found any yet that are practical for us, <laughs> meaning we, we've boiled it down where our objective is we do not want our projects to result in unmitigated harm to individuals. And we're still working on defining what harm is, but <laughs> we want to protect individual privacy. We want to protect individuals from data weaponization, either caused by leakage of the data to a not nice third party, or uh, poor judgment on the part of uh, leadership. Uh, I have a good example of this. I did a project 10 years ago where we experimented by distributing smartphones to taxi drivers to see whether the GPS data generated by the drivers would be useful for making decisions in transport planning. Now that sounds like very cute, like of course, but at the time we didn't know. And so we were building models to make it happen. And our government counterparts were excited because they wanted to use the data to give tickets to taxi drivers and to see where they went and use the data for policing. And we, what? <laughs> no, but we completely understood the instinct. It makes sense. And so um, you can have a well-intentioned project 
but uh, there needs to be some norms and agreements in place about what a reasonable use of, of the data are within your project. Um, and I guess that goes along with our next one. We want to protect individuals from well-intentioned but misguided or mistargeted policies caused by poor data or data bias or poor analysis or a misinterpretation of the results. And the last one uh, is everything is executed beautifully and perfectly, but uh, the problem statement was not ethical. Um, you need a well-informed problem statement from the beginning to ensure everything you're doing <laughs> is not going to cause harm to individuals. And we limit our scope to this. There's other pieces on data security and privacy that, that often get thrown into these list of principles, but we're trying to tease out the things that we really care about the most. And with that, develop checklists for our staff so that it's very clear to them what they need to do to ensure they are not causing undue harm to individuals through their projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. That that emphasis on harm, of course, is central to a lot of the work going on in this area and, and central, among other things, to UNESCO's own uh, frameworks. Uh, Yulia, I think you want to go down from the big picture to something a bit more granular, please. Yes, you dreamt uh, indeed big uh, with the first uh, question, Holly. Now, uh, uh, change and positive change is incremental. So let's talk about solutions. Even if at operational scale happening now, even if nascent in the private or the public sectors that you see um, as interesting, as deserving a closer look, as uh, having a possibility for scale up. Could you name a few? I mentioned that project I had done some years ago with the smartphones and taxis. Um, that project grew and we partnered uh, with a private firm that generated these data. And, and that led to other initiatives, partnering with other private firms that were generating data that we found were very useful for our transport colleagues to plan and, and manage transit systems. Staff were increasingly realizing that we're working in very data scarce environments, making significant decisions about infrastructure and services. And there were information available if only we could link to it in an efficient way. So uh, about two and a half years ago, under the guise of our chief economist, we started the development data partnership. This initiative began on the legal side, setting up a standard data license agreement. It has a master framework structure where we sign this agreement once with a company on behalf of all staff, and it includes schedules that we can append to the master agreement that describe the type of data and projects that we would be engaged in together. This substantially reduces the legal churn and the legal turnaround on our side, because rather than individual teams signing one-off agreements, just one agreement per company that can cover almost any conceivable use case you can think of. And we quickly realized that there is a hiccup in our great data license agreement where uh, companies maybe didn't want to sign our agreement. They would prefer we sign theirs. We needed some leverage. So we reached out to our neighbors in DC, the IMF and the Inter-American Development Bank uh, and invited them to join us and they did and together we revised the data license agreement so that when we would approach companies, uh, it's just one. So if a company wanted to work with IMF, they could work with all three of us using the same data license agreement. When that agreement is signed, we post the opportunity on our intranet platform, our marketplace, uh, which is accessible by all staff from World Bank, IMF, IDB, and, and now the OECD as well. Uh, and here, staff can explore the data sets, see how other colleagues are using the data in their projects, uh, and most importantly, they can apply to use the data in their own project. And these applications are received by our data partners who can decide whether they want their data to support this project or whether their data could support the project. Uh, 
um, whether it's sufficient. And on the back end, the World Bank centrally manages the data ingest and access management. So when a company sends data, they don't have to send data to every individual in every organization multiple times, increasing costs and risks. Instead, uh, they transfer data once, and then our team facilitates access based on the proposals that are approved uh, and when staff agree to the terms of the data license agreements. And, you know, we're like, we're pretty proud of ourselves. We now have 170 projects in our system. Uh, more than 60 of those are pandemic related. Um, but it's, it's not enough uh, because of the way we are organized, where we have sector teams with brilliant transfer engineers and health specialists. And then in other units, we have our data scientists and our geospatial specialists. And there aren't many clear lines to marry the two. So uh, we had to set up a system to support our teams, helping them identify which data sets could help them, helping create a, a realistic picture of what data can and cannot do, help them develop the methodologies. Um, and Yes, and as mentioned earlier, ensure that the project statements are, are ethical and reasonable. Um, and so with that, uh, we are growing. Um, we're inviting other UN organizations to join the partnership. Um, and we're continuing to add new data partners. We now have 25 and we're very proud and grateful uh, to have them work with us. And we're working to better disseminate what we call data goods, uh, the methodologies that come out of these. We're starting to see teams adopt methodologies developed by other teams. Um, so for example, we had a team work in the Ukraine um, to understand the digital divide and they leverage data from UCLA. Uh, which runs speedtest.com, which provides very granular temporal maps of internet connectivity. Uh, and with that, they can inform government investments in broadband. And now that methodology is being used by two teams in South America, Colombia and oof, one other country. <laughs> and, and that's really rewarding for us to see. Thank you very much. You've, you've given us some great examples. Um, this is perhaps a good time to tell us a little bit more at a more general level about uh, the um, development data partnership, its aims, its structure, its results, where you see it going. I'm sure that everyone is keen to understand better where all these examples are coming from and, and uh, how that might progress in the future. Oh, yes. So there's a few pieces to that. Um, I, our aims originally, uh, and still are, <laughs> have been to make it easier for international organization staff to experiment with private sector data to see where they can improve decision making in the public sector. If you already know what you're going to do, like you already are familiar with the private sector data set, you know exactly how it works, you know the method, then the partnership doesn't have as much of a role. That team should just go buy, go buy the data. <laughs> but for us, facilitating that bridge. Now, now that we've grown, uh, we're going to have to think a little harder about our business model um, because there, <laughs> it is an enormous amount of work to support 170 teams, 25 data partners across four organizations. Um, and we need to think how sustainable is the model as we grow? Would we need to grow our team? Do we continue on this trajectory? Or do we start to leverage what we've built to solve some of those more global barriers that we had talked about earlier? Uh, so in June, uh, we're starting something new. We're forming a strategic advisory group where we're inviting leadership from all of our data partners to join and contribute to the future direction of the partnership. To date, we've been led by a board with representation from the international development partners. So this is pretty new. And 
we'll discuss some short-term needs about how we can sustain our growth. Um, but we'll also be looking in the long term about, for example, this model that we've developed would also work very well for universities. We would love if universities in emerging economies could form a similar type of partnership program so that students could get access to the treasure trove of data resources generated by private firms, where normally I think only the these all-star schools can get access to these data, but can we um, can we level the playing field and make it easier using the model that we've built so that we can create that next generation of data scientists in emerging economies who can responsibly use these data to inform government decisions. Um, and on responsible data use, uh, we're crafting these principles, implementing them in our own work, getting feedback from the companies, uh, and then I would love to see our platform leverage this to uh, start <laughs> um, improving them and increasing buy-in so that we can start creating those international norms on what it means to use data responsibly. Based on your work on data partnership, what would be the lessons learned and models uh, you think that could be transferred to governments that are thinking of doing something similar? What you're doing now is data primarily for the use by international organizations for an in international development sector. Now, if governments want to follow suit and do this for their own in-government decision and policy making, what do you think they should be doing and what models uh, they should be following and lessons learned you could be offering? Oh, that's interesting, Yulia. So many. <laughs> um, so our our ultimate output from the development data partnership is what we call a data good. And this is a methodology or insight that could be replicated by others who uh, sign their own licenses with the data partners, including our government counterparts. The World Bank and other international organizations we work with, I would posit are organized very similarly to a government with a healthy bureaucracy <laughs> divisions organized by sector. We have a transport unit and an energy unit and a water unit um, and a treasury. And being able to knit together the different resources in IT, legal, procurement, data science, governance to make the partnership happen uh, would be similar to what a national government would want to undertake. So, in terms of lessons that I think governments may benefit from, uh, as we learned everything the hard way, <laughs> would be starting with our master data license agreement uh, and how that's structured, would be on our procedures and systems that we've set up with IT to facilitate secure data storage and access management, um, our systems for ensuring compliance with the terms of the data license agreements, which is in itself a very large undertaking. Our marketplace, where you figure you have a data set, and what's exciting about these data sets is we never know what creative bananas use cases our staff are going to come up with to solve a problem in their sector. And we would want the governments to be very much the same so that uh, if a national government signed an agreement with company X, then your transport, water, et cetera, um, ministries or departments should have an opportunity to find those data. So the marketplace and then the technical support. Uh, we built a whole data desk and data documentation system to minimize the amount of resources we need to expend to help teams get on their way. Uh, and then there's uh, ancillary policies on security, privacy, and responsible data use. There's a lot that needs to be in place. It's all possible, and I, I would imagine it's all easier if, they, if others could copy <laughs> and, and at least build on what we did. Thank you very much, uh, Holly, for the very interesting comments on, on solutions, uh, existing solutions and, and possible uh, future solutions. In uh, concluding this discussion, 
Uh, we'd like to talk a bit about um, uh, data and uh, policy, in particular from the perspective which is absolutely central to everything we do at UNESCO's Inclusive Policy Lab and indeed in other UNESCO work streams as well, which is connecting knowledge, including data as one kind of knowledge, uh, to policy. Um, there's a critical nexus between what we know and how what we know informs our decisions and policy shifts. So I'd, I'd like to uh, invite you to, uh, to, to comment on this, uh, looking at data as an area of knowledge and policy action, uh, including data about data, um, uh, data as object. Uh, in your opinion, uh, based on your experience, what are the key gaps that researchers interested in these issues need to uh, dig into? In, in terms of analyzing data systems, uh, both the data themselves and the systems of how data uh, are used, whether publicly, privately, or in conjunction between public and private. What are, what are the things we don't know that we really need to know about how data operates? Well, what we found through the partnership program is that when it comes to leveraging what we're calling new data, non-traditional data, private sector data in public sector decision making, it's all new. And most of our staff are really not sure whether these data will actually provide the insights and answers that they are hoping for. And so the biggest gap right now is just this early discovery, which data sets and, and through which combinations of data sets and methods can we generate insights that really improve how governments provide public infrastructure and services? Uh, for example, if you take the transportation sector, um, any transport project will begin with a, an analysis of travel patterns. Where are people coming from? Where are they going? How many? By what mode? And the answers to these uh, are partially derived from decennial household surveys, which may or may not actually be taken every 10 years. And if you think about it, if you want to know where people are coming from and going, don't most telecoms know that through mobile phone data? Maybe that would be a larger, better sample size to understand origin destination patterns. Now, if we know that, how come every government doesn't use telecom data. And it's because there's uh, still some work to be done to understand how we can integrate these new insights into the traditional travel demand models. It's not that straightforward, it's still new. So the work to be done, I would posit, is largely around methods, discovering what works, what doesn't, what are the biases, what do we need to be concerned about, um, before we can practically implement these in policies that affect people. Thinking in uh, disciplinary terms uh, with respect to the development data partnership, are, are you happy with the balance? Do you feel that there are some big gaps that you would like to fill? I'm inventing maybe, do you need more historians? Do you need more people uh, uh, working from um, literary disciplines? Do you need stronger input from philosophers? Are there, are there gaps of that nature that uh, strike you? Oh, wow, that is so interesting. I will be honest, John, I had not thought about it along those lines, but you have just given me very much to think about. Um, when I think about the gaps, I had been thinking about them a little differently. In a traditional bank lending project, we'll have a team led by a sector specialist, your transport or water specialist. And when they want to experiment with these new data to create new methods, we need to pair them often with a pretty large co-team of data scientists, data engineer, if the data are very large, um, a geospatial specialist, because often the data scientists will deeply know some things, but our geospatial specialists will deeply know others. Um, a web designer slash app specialist, because everybody wants a dashboard. Um, and that, and and these modern data solutions re require all of these disciplines. That's just after the data are received. Never mind the legal counsel, procurement specialists, and others. Now, 
do we also want to integrate the ethicists and others that can provide a more historical view? I think that's really interesting and I'm going to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be very happy, I certainly will, to continue that conversation because of course in, in our programs we do have a kind of vested interest in promoting uh, the contribution of the social sciences and humanities to these issues, including the parts of the social sciences and humanities that people maybe uh, don't think of. Uh, obviously, you don't need to make an argument for economists being involved in these discussions because they're going to be involved anyway. But it's maybe less obvious that anthropologists, philosophers and historians have something to bring to the party, to the table, uh, um, and perhaps useful to explore what they can bring. Uh, and of course, the only way of doing that is to have imaginative methodological conversations and to create the spaces where people with different kinds of expertise can actually talk, um, including outside the predefined boundaries of what usually counts as a as a project. So the scope for some imagination and creativity here, and maybe we'll have the opportunity to explore it. Um, Yulia, please. Well, the second part of uh, this uh, question is always targeting policymakers. You identified the knowledge gaps now targeting and, and talking to our knowledge uh, partners. If you would be crystallizing uh, several recommendations uh, targeting policymakers, what would those be? What should they be doing and thinking um, when considering forming partnerships between the public and the private sectors around data? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think we're, we're starting to see some very practical and valuable uses of private sector data and public sector decision making. Um, for example, in the Ukraine, where the team needed to assess the digital divide and identify those populations that didn't have good internet connectivity to inform uh, investments in broadband, they leveraged data from our partner, Ukla. Another team working in Nairobi on a road safety project um, had difficulty identifying where crashes occurred most frequently uh, because the administrative records weren't complete. And so they leverage data from Waze and Twitter and Uber and other sources to get a much clearer picture of where the issues were uh, so that they could make targeted investments. We have a team uh, at the beginning of the pandemic that wanted to understand uh, how lockdown measures uh, and were affecting movement as well as food security. Uh, and so they worked with Premise and some of our geolocation data providers to be able to answer those questions for the government so that they could decide how to respond. Um, and we, oh, there's so many, Yulia. Uh, so I, I, these are pretty specific, but the idea is um, through this experimentation on real projects, we can come up with solutions, help governments use better information to make decisions than they could before. And that's with our current model where things are done through the international organizations. But I do hope that eventually we can move towards a system where governments can do these uh, as well. Ali, thank you for a great discussion. Now, maybe there's something he would have really liked us to ask you that we didn't. So, you know, this is the opportunity. What, what question would you like to answer that didn't even get asked? <laughs> Oh, that's, that's a good question. Oh, I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to have one, but it's just an opportunity. How about when am I free for happy hour? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It feels like an interview, right? And then the panel asks you, do you have questions for us? <laughs> exactly. I thought of that myself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Love it. Um, no, I've really enjoyed talking to you both. I find um, opportunities like these are a great way to, to crystallize and reflect uh, about what we've done and where we want to go. Uh, so I really appreciate it. And it sounds like it'd be really fun to collaborate with UNESCO. <laughs> so I hope that can be an outcome too. Holly, Holly Krambeck from the World Bank, thank you very much for spending an hour with us discussing uh, 
uh, data issues uh, in, in connection with the public good. It was a pleasure to have you. Uh, and I hope we'll have opportunities to follow up uh, this conversation. Yudia, thank you very much for co-hosting uh, the podcast. And to everyone listening, um, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, please come back and catch the next episodes of UNESCO's Inclusive Policy Lab pod podcast series. Uh, we have new content uh, basically at least twice a month. So stay tuned and goodbye.